What's up, everyone? It's 2 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon, which means you're tuning in to Cannabis Legalization News. I'm producer Lauren, and today we're going to be speaking with Chanel Lindsay, founder and president of Ardent. They have a product that's like an amazing decarbing process. It makes the decarbing process 100 times easier for cannabis consumers. So we're going to be speaking with them in a few minutes. But first, we do have to get into a little bit of cannabis legalization news. So what's going on, Tom and Miggy? Hey. Hey, Lauren. How are you? Thanks for introducing us. <laughs> yeah. Man, hey, I guess you heard the only news to talk about, right? Oh, you mean marijuana is a gateway drug? No, I oh I was going to talk about how Seattle got like somebody robbed at a uh, oh, dispensary, dude. and yeah. they they were robbed at gunpoint too, which robbed is at gunpoint, and like that just now is Seattle different in the sense that you guys don't have everything mainlined to the cops. What do you mean by mainly? As far as like a like you know the ISP address goes straight to to the uh, the police station, so that, you know, if anything happens, the police are like there it is, and they can they can go. Yeah, you know, I don't know what kind of requirement it is. I know, like, the LCB, the governing body, has a shit ton of security requirements for, you know, seed to store, but you would think there'd be, like, a, an emergency switch or something for, yeah, for, for cash-only like business. videos that I saw, like, it didn't even look like it was high def. Like, the stuff in Illinois, like, you've got, like, high def on the, the videos. So when they were, like, saying, oh, we're still looking for uh, the whereabouts of any suspects, I'd be like, no, no, it's... It, it's this guy run him in a database you know right you're looking for a blurry guy that's what you're yeah. looking for right now you're looking for that that smear uh, he, that guy kind of looks like i mean he's too in focus though it can't yeah. be him yeah. i mean if you're gonna have a business i would invest in the high quality type video that's you know. i mean in competitive states like illinois you're not going to win unless you do but let's de let's then talk about uh the gateway theory of mr joe biden oh jesus and then how about the counter gateway theory of mr yang Oh, the counter gateway theory? Why don't you explain that? Oh, well, right away when Biden came out with that, Yang posted on Twitter a picture of him in a grow, like all smocked up. It was yeah. pretty awesome. I was like, he's he's definitely in there with the HPS lights. That's why he needs that protect <laughs> covering. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, man. And so that that is just the remnant. But I mean, he's a 76-year-old man that spent most of his life fighting for the drug wars in favor of the drug war. I mean, who was there in the Senate in the 80s? Joe Biden, right. you know? Um well, he's from the, the era of the criminal predator, right? Right. And then, you know, whose bill passed? Which one of the people that's running for president? The Moore Act, the yeah. Marijuana Opportunity and Restoration Act. Uh, wait, M-O-R-E-E, -E. expungement. Yeah, that's, expungement. that's Kamala Harris's. And so I oh, can't shit. wait. Like, where's her? Why isn't she like going nuts on Facebook or is she yeah. not got enough money? It's all going to Tom Schneider because he's a wealthy man. Well, I didn't realize uh, she was behind it. Uh, I was thinking more of a Cory Booker because I think Cory Booker and it wouldn't also. It, uh, what's his name? Bernie Sanders. I bet all three of them are on it. Maybe, sure. maybe even Warren. I don't know. I could go through the uh, line by line to see exactly who sponsored it. But that was huge. The second biggest news, I guess, of the Congress this year. So now that's two for the first time ever. Not one, which was yeah. the first. But two bills have made it out of a uh, legislative committee in Congress and another floor vote now coming up on marijuana in the whatever. What Congress is this? So this one was uh, under 19. Senate. Is it? But this one was Senate, though, right? It, it was approved through the Senate. No, um, they're usually introduced in both houses. And then oh. they that's the reconciliation process. So I haven't done that video yet where you know we talk about how this is all a, a civics lesson and so you know back when we were we were talking in the green room beforehand that's right everybody we have a green room it's it's basically exactly this except we're not live and so we were talking like you know how um you know back then uh, there was the uh the ability to just say like hey man it should be legal because right. you have that juvenile understanding of how the system works and now you're like oh i see why it took so long See well, it's like the, the home grow fight we have here, man. And I was telling you how I learned about the bicameral process. It's like, wow, that it's so harder to, to, to make a right than it is to create the wrong. Like, right. So now they have to get it all marked up in the Senate. So we aren't sure what's going to happen with the Safe Banking Act, because that's going to have to go get marked up in the Senate. But the Senate ain't really thrilled. Oh, thank you, Engineering Cannabis. Let's go ahead and show that one. Mr. Booker, Mr. Merkley, nice. Mr. Wyden, and Ms. Warren sponsor. All right, so that's probably a little different. I think Kamala Harris introduced it, and then other people join her and sponsor it. So maybe, uh, do you think Donald Trump's going to win next year? Think like, how do you think this impeachment's going to end up? Right? Oh, man, dude. You know, there's all these talking heads, and and I just wish people. And then again, we're in a luxury position where 
being an avid activist, whatever, uh, just someone who wants to see change, you pay attention now to the politics. Like as a kid, like we're talking, like when I was 18, I was like, why can't we just like, uh, you know, pass a rule or whatever. And now I'm 46 and I learned like, holy shit, you got to go through the state. You got to go to the house. You got to go. And then it's still not done. <laughs> yeah. And then it has to go. And so you get it all the way past through one house and the other one's like, oh no, we haven't approved it yet. We have to mark all this stuff up and then we're going to send it back to you and they won't match. And then you have to do the reconciliation. And then eventually it got signed or it got yeah. passed. And then, you know, will it be vetoed by the time it hits somebody's desk? It's that's the there's question. so many things that are out there. And that's why, like, once you get a law on the books, even if it is unconstitutional, like marijuana prohibition, it can just stay there for decades. Well, well, how long has this been going on now? 182 years. Yeah. So and now we're just getting to the point of even politicians are not afraid to, to to stand with it that's that's where we're at finally after all this time i don't know man like you know when we're putting together these teams and they're trying to have community outreach uh sometimes people are a little bit hesitant to accept cannabis money i mean like you've seen those uh, articles that'll come out about how uh school district returns dispensaries uh donations stuff like that it's, I, st it's we're still suffering from the fear mongering that happened from you know the early days you know people grew think that you know we blaze i mean how many shows have we done where i'm just lighting up and smoking through well that's usually on the cannabis congregation because you're typically at work on our wednesday well, program <laughs> yeah yeah you know, but you i mean know. again i didn't turn to a bat <laughs> not yet not not and that is the legitimate testimony of dr edvard okay edvard munch was the painter i'm gonna go I, I wrote that book 10 years ago. I forgot the guy's name, but he was our first marijuana star from like 1937 through 1962. Yeah, no, just years and years of just bad. It's kind of like as I'm watching this impeachment and then you see the uh, uh, the adults, which I hate to say, I'm not the adults. The, the, you know, I'm not a Democrat, Republican. You know, uh, last James. time I voted for Stein. Is that his name? It's Dr. James Munch. Oh, right on. <laughs> Munch. The first. If, uh, uh, an animal doctor or something like that from Temple yeah. University, the first cannabis czar knew absolutely nothing about it, made him blind as a bat or something. No, wait, it transformed him into a bat. It was like worse than a PH, uh, PCP trip. You know, it's just right? something else. And let's not forget the, the whole white women and sex thing. Like, like why is even oh, race yeah. even involved here? Like, right. why, do we even why wouldn't they have just gone for women? Why did yeah. it have to be the white ones? Oh, because we're trying to terrify them. Because we're trying to terrify them. Yes. Yeah, we're we're swaying the opinions. We're swaying the, the popular, you know, and that the minority or majority at the time, you know, and now we're well, this hodgepodge. Uh, yeah, I guess they were a majority, but then they also like rigged all the rules so that it didn't matter if you were anything except for a white man. Right. Yeah. Well, they were still dealing with the gerrymandering shit too from that, all that. You know, oh, we're going to deal with gerrymandering the whole time because when you gerrymander, you get to pick who votes for you. Right. I mean, yeah. we kind of guess who who's on our side. Right. Kinda, now, now for you guys, that, that zoning, does that reflect anything with the gerrymandering? Is there anything that are you talking about Chicago's cannabis zoning? That one's yeah. Weird. All right. Chicago's cannabis zoning. So I have like a thing for the ISBA in a couple of weeks and I was waiting for Chicago to kind of like do one of those so I could read it. And they're. Um, their zoning ordinance hasn't been up that long, but it's been up maybe about a month. And uh, it's an interesting process. And like you have to mail notice to everybody adjacent to your property and you have to have public hearings to get that uh, special use permit from the city. But before that, you have to submit everything that you submit to the state of Illinois. So like the whole application to the city. And I think before that, you well, no. No, after you submit the whole application, then you do the lottery to find out which one of the seven you're in. And then you can find the property and then you have to have the public hearing and then eventually you'll get the special use permit. So I'm just looking at that and I'm like, hey, uh, what about all these other BLS di districts that don't have that kind of crap? Yeah. How about you apply there? Um, oh, you're about to go through a year of pain out there. Just the, the aches and pains of uh, creating the whole industry base. Yeah, uh, it's going to be a shit show. Uh, it's going to be a shit show, and hopefully I will sleep okay. But tomorrow morning, <laughs> train to Chicago, 830. Leaving, right on. leaving from Princeton. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, our guest, she's part of the uh, Massachusetts board. Yeah, that's really awesome. Uh, the guest that we have today has got a very storied past in the Massachusetts cannabis industry. And so it's going to yeah. be really interesting because there's uh, – uh, 
similarities. And this, the, the Moore Act is just a perpetuation of that, where you have this criminal justice, this social justice, uh, this um, uh, social equity, as we call it in Illinois, aspect of the cannabis uh, prohibition and then the legalization to go fix the problems that they caused. Yeah. And that's looking like it's, you know, the thing that's really putting the wind, you know, really at our back, because then you have that moral superiority right off the bat. And they've been trying to do stuff out in Massachusetts. And we're going to be trying to do stuff in Illinois. And I realize out in Seattle where you're at, uh, you kind of have like a um, libertarian bent where it's like, whatever, man, everybody's everybody. And uh, yeah, we don't well, do we, that. We have we, we have judgment and morals. We have the uh, well, now we have the National Cannabis, I think, National Cannabis Association, one of those fuckers, uh, Josh's group. Uh, they're actually petitioning the LCB and trying to create requirements for Washington's infrastructure, which I think is like six years too late, but whatever. Um, but I, I always think it's kind of neat how you guys over on the East Coast are kind of just getting the shit right. Whereas the guys on the West Coast, you know, we're the forefront. We're the beginning of it uh, as far as like, you know, 215 was a gateway to legalization. And then uh, but it seems like to me, it's kind of like with uh, uh, like slavery, you know, how the northeast corner was uh, uh you know the most racist of it all right because they, yeah. they had the piety of that but then they also didn't have any uh any uh you know homogeneous you know no, no homogenous homogenous is when it's all one thing diversity they lacked a lot of that well there was still a lot of uh, um pro uh anti-slavery movement up there you know the abolitionists that was a huge uh in that area and i just kind of think that northeast corner has kind of always been ahead at least progressive thinking just it has to like, hey, let's watch California do it first. Ah, look, no one fucking died. All right, we can do it now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Hey, well, Colorado is going to do it first because Colorado, like if you're from or live in Colorado, you're just a little bit more extreme. And it's like you're just a little bit more like hold my beer than if you live in Nebraska, Iowa or Illinois, uh, because, you know, it's just more of an adventure type culture and yeah. uh, personal freedom, of course, personal freedoms. Uh, right. So that's that's big over and where you're at too the Washington area that whole libertarian bent of personal freedoms you know I'm not hurting anybody leave me yeah, alone right. yeah. don't tell me how to live man oh we'll tell you how to live why didn't I see you at church on Sunday right yeah or, or you know I, yeah I mean that's why we're here because this the, the law itself is just wrong right right it's like, right. It's we're like trying to legislate a morality like uh, Laguardia said in the 40s and we haven't listened I'm looking at you New York. LaGuardia told you that in the 40s. You just kept locking them up. Why? Yeah. I mean, we had separate drinking fountains. Was that a good law back then, too? I mean, we got so much correction we're still going on and doing. You know, this whole make America great again. We're, we're doing it. Well, let's let's, let's talk to somebody who is making America great again. Yeah. Let's bring our guests on and discuss how to make cannabis last longer and where she's coming from. What's up, Chanel? Hey, guys. Hey, everybody. Hey. How's it going? Hi. Live Great. from Boston. Thank you for joining us, Chanel. <laughs> yes. Can you tell us a little bit about Arden? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Arden is my baby. Um, I developed this decarboxylating machine here. Um, I've been using cannabis now for over 20 years, but for actually over 18 years to treat an ovarian cyst that I got after my son was born. Uh, so for me, this has been a really long journey, not only developing this product, which basically allows people to take their raw flour and their bud, put it in here. Um, it has a heating core and some sensors. And when it comes out, you can transform that into any product that you would see on a dispensary shelf for a fraction of the price. So basically it's a little wonder machine that allows people to have better access to cannabis, to be able to make accurate dosing and to just generally spread the education and knowledge of this plant so that more people can have access to it. Interesting. I like um, your website because it's very educational on the decarb aspect. I, as a longtime consumer, never cared about decarbing. My wife is the one that turned me on to it, actually. I'm pretty uh, sure we, you cared about decarbing. Wow. Well, yeah. yeah, in my pipe, not in. Right. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. My wife's not so, so much a smoker. So uh, we had a plant that was six foot and had a nice little harvest. And, uh, you know, instead of smoking it, she wanted to cook with it. Yeah. And, you know, old school thinking, let's just shove it with the brownies and, and mix it that way. Yeah, no. then, so you had some yeah. whole wheat brownies, it sounds like. But it was like whole fiber. weed brownies, you know. <laughs> Lots of fiber. Lots of fiber. Yeah, yeah and you would have you would have been on the right track. And I bet you the bunch of weed didn't feel anything. And then um, 
you know, still were like, all right, is this, is this even really work? You know, um, yeah. so people, people, they don't realize, you know, that decarb is like the number one process when it comes to cannabis. It's the difference between literally having THC and CBD in your plant or not. And um, for me, when I was making these medicines back, you know, I was a young mom. Um, I had my son when I was in college. And by the time that um, I was trying to make these medicines, like it was, it was very dangerous, right? Um, I, I was growing my own medicine, I was making my products, and I had to really make sure that, um, you know, number one, that I was doing a good job at it. And number two, that like people weren't finding out about it. And one of the biggest problems was like how much it smelled when you were trying to decarb. And I used to make my own pills. Yeah. And so like I would grind up my flour and then set the oven to the lowest temperature setting, which probably is 250 for you at home. And uh, then you would get your, your timer out and you would tell Google or whatever clock you were using to set a specific time. And then you would check it and then you'd have your decarboxylated flour that you could make into capsules. Yeah, and it's exactly. And I would use the crock pot sometimes too. You could try mm. to get like some even heating there. And so that was basically my method for 10 plus years, just making these different things, trying to, you know, trying to do it when my na neighbors weren't home, you know, because it would just be uh. so dank on the like entire, I, my, my neighbors lived in the house next door to me and they could smell it when I was making my medicine. So, um, but I really thought that that was the only way because at that time, really, that was just, you know, what you did. And then medical marijuana came to Massachusetts in 2012 and a laboratory opened up down the street from my house. And so by that time I was a lawyer and I just, you know, was a cannabis nerd because I don't know, you know, I just, I, I've been you guys know, you guys know, you love this plant, yeah. you know? Um, and so obviously I'd heard about decarboxylation and had been just trying to like, you know, go based on what's on the internet as far as the timing, the temperature, that kind of thing. I thought I had my little process down pat. And then I went and I brought my medicine to the lab just to confirm because I was going to start teaching people about how to make this medicine. And the results came back on the decarb and I was shocked because it was like 30% of that wasn't activated. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so this was me after a decade of like being an expert doing this and I still was wasting 30%. So I was like, okay, maybe it's just like the time, the, the timing's wrong. I just need to put more time on. And okay. I went, I went and I did that and I saw like with the crock pot, what was happening was as you increase the time, the decarb wasn't increasing, but you were starting to lose THC, mm. you know? And that's where it's coming to, there's like a really old myth that you can only get more than like, you can't get more than 70% of it or you start degrading it. And I think part of it comes from that, like, you know, in, in some cases that's true. And then I tried the oven methods and you couldn't really hone in on that time and temperature because you're getting like these fluctuations. And I was like, okay, let me work with this lab to hone in on like the right time and temp. Once I had that, I was like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this. I'm going to make a so device. Does it turn it into just the plant material? I mean, how do you then, because a lot of that is, you know, then you have Miggy's brownies problem where you have wonderful fiber intake. Yeah. But it might not taste the best. Yeah. So I think that one thing people need to realize is that when they're thinking about precision decarboxylation, like you got to erase everything you've like known about weed before and how you've encountered it. Right. Because. Miggy's brownies were only had a lot of weed in them because he had to use a lot of weed in those brownies. Right. Yeah. So when you're decarbing and I'll show you how it works, it's uh, here's the device right here and it has this thermal heating core. So I knew the core needed to be like all the way around rather than like up and above in the oven. So it's like this mm -hmm. thermal blanket all the way around with the yeah. heater. And then there's two sensors in there and it's really just like a lab grade little oven. When it comes out, yeah, the bud right then, you could eat it. And you wouldn't be, you'd be so surprised how many people just eat the bud right away. Because it's not like you have to have a, like a whole gram. Think about it. If you have 21%, 20% THC when it comes out, that's 200 milligrams in every gram. So you're talking about 0.1 gram to mm -hmm. get 20 milligrams. So think about how much you can stretch that. And I think that for me, helping patients, like especially people, there are people that are treating for cancer and other things where they need like, thousand milligrams a day and when they're hitting the dispensary like or that that's not even an option for them you know yeah. with you know in certain states there's like even in massachusetts you know what our um adult use maximum serving size is five milligrams are you <laughs> kidding me no I I, for, I, uh, for they, they like, five milligrams five milligrams a serving that's a rounding right? error yes. ten. Yeah, it, ours are ten. You. Ours are standardized to ten, <laughs> and like for kids that have no idea what they're doing, 
you know, they can eat one and that might be enough for them. And then, you know, if you hear of the stories of people that only needed a half, I'm just kind of like, really? Yeah. <laughs> but like no, six, six, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it, so th those are the kind of things that like people are up against, I'm saying, when yeah. they're trying to, um, you know, to access this. Well, six people really need a lot too. I mean, uh, I, I told Tom before, I know guys that are suffering real severe conditions, you know, inside and they just dab and dab and, and walk away from it. Whereas I would lie down comfortably and call it a good day. You know, uh, <laughs> sick people need high amounts yeah. of concentrates and uh, the decarb. I mean, it helps spread your dollar out for sure. Right. Yeah. And then a lot of people are making like the capsules. That's really popular too. Like they'll decarb and then they'll just like break it up and make a bunch of capsules and use, you know, use those. Or when it comes out, for those people that don't want to deal with like the actual plant material, you can just place it right back in the device with your oil or your butter, put it through another cycle and it pulls that out. And one thing like Ardent, we're super focused on science and testing results. You know, there's yeah. so much, so much. And you guys see it all the time. So much conjecture about like the science of cannabis. And it's just like the science, the, the testing. And then like are the laws don't even do the conjecture of the science. Oh, okay. They just have arbitrary numbers that make no yeah. sense. Make shit up. Yeah, it's just yeah. like not based on anything. And people, you wouldn't believe like what people think about decarboxylation, what you can, what you can't do. And, you know, and it was it was a big thing when we came on the scene um, back in 2016, you know? Imagine like me coming to the scene. I'm like this like, you know, young looking women like, hey guys, you've been doing it wrong all along. You know what I mean? Like, do you think people were like, yes, uh, they, it took a long time for us. And it was that science and the testing results to be like, okay, cool. Like you could be getting half, you know, you could be using half as much. You're, you're not interested in that, you know? And then once you kind of get those, you know, those people that actually have, like you said, been doing it for 20 years and they see how much easier it is, then you start to really like, you know, get that momentum. Hey, can I ask you how much, uh, let's go over a gram challenge right here. Cause we're in three different States, coast to coast huh. Huh. from Massachusetts to Washington state. What's a gram of good weed going for in your guys' area? Depends no. on who you ask. Well, normal. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> oh, good. Well, we have pot shops here. And uh, oh, you guys don't have pot shops in Massachusetts. We do. We have, we have a whole one shop open serving the whole Boston Metro area. Holy yeah, right now. Yes, wow. one single, okay? And it still has lines out the door um, all the sure. time. So, well, so we have- the legal gram then. What's the, where do they sell a gram for? And, but we have medical, like, let me not be too oh, dramatic. Sure. Like we have medical and we've had that for a long time, but you're paying like, you know, between 15 and $25 a gram at the store. Yeah. That's about ridiculous. right for- for for decent flour yeah, here right. too. Decent flour in uh, Illinois, about twenty bucks a gram. Oh, that, that that would break you. That would you break know? you. So like you're gonna you're gonna have twelve point seven new possible. I'm sorry, twelve point seven million new possible customers in the state of Illinois. And I realize that's the whole population, so it might only be two point five million. <laughs> but still, that's that's another two point five million customers that are going to be thrilled to be able to buy your product out here. Yeah, and that, that that dispensary weed, yeah, you gotta you gotta definitely stretch that. Um, but but just like Miggy was saying, like you you um people that grow at home, like those folks, you know, I re I get really excited when I see people like at harvest time, you know, because they realize that it's like not just their flour, but it's also like their trim that they can use, their sugar, yeah. leaf, basically anything that's left over. You know, when you look when you look at um trim. That has like on average between of some good flour, six to eight percent THC. That's like 60 milligrams per gram if you're activating it. So I like to think people can like move beyond just using it for like their medical or wellness and they can start to experiment and make all of these different things because um, especially like for women, I think that we're just like underutilizing this plan so many different ways. I didn't even know that you could. Uh, I saw your video with you putting Keith in there. I didn't even think about yeah, that. Keith Yep, keef or and even concentrate. So mm. you're talking about everybody who's dabbing, like there's a lot of people that have concentrates and they want to make edibles. And it's like, cool, we have this little um, silicone sleeve that you put in, throw them, throw them right in there. And then when they come, that's like the easiest way to make um, like butter and stuff. Now all you got to do is mix it with it afterwards and you can make that's all awesome. these different things. 
Yeah. Because like they sell the, the, the concentrates are usually sold by the gram over in Illinois. Mm -hmm. So like you get a gram for 70 bucks, let's say yeah. or some butter or something. And so doing the math, I mean, 70 grams, 70%, I mean, yeah. you, know, you know, one gram, 70%, 700 milligrams. That's right. That's, that's like seven bags of those uh, gummies that you're getting at, at oh, yeah. 10 by 10. Cause I mean, it's, so that's, that's really, really cool. And then so you can also like make whatever you want too, because a lot of times it's like, there's a lot of good options at the dispensary, but they don't have like all fresh options of like fresh baked items and other things that people like Absolutely. really There's like. No fresh baked items. Everything has to be prepackaged in Illinois. Do you guys have, cause like that's something it we, cannabis is not legalized until we have a good cannabis baked good, you know, like a cannabis bakery <laughs> where you can have it like a fresh donut, you know? Oh, but no. That yeah. That's, and that's, so that's basically what we're trying to do with Arden is because we have these, um, we have these different edibles kits and things like that. Second. So right here, here's like our magic shell kit. So it's oh, a, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's an ice cream kit. So basically oh it has, God. it has a chocolate in here. And so you'll throw that in there after you make the oil, you throw it in and then you can pour it over and it's like, you know, turns hard, you know, when you're yeah. little and you get That's a the shit right there. There, man. Yeah. And then you eat it and stuff like that. And so we have all of these, um, like, cake and bake good kids that's like the next okay. evolution of art and so that people can go and they can do that at home because yeah. one one thing i found is that people they get like very nervous about like cooking it with cannabis at home because they don't think they're going to do it right and honestly the it smell. pains me yeah. Yeah, the smell and it pains me to see people like literally use an ounce of weed to make a thing of brownies i'm like come on guys don't well, you realize maybe he's, like, he's still alive yeah he's right yeah no <laughs> But he wasted so much, though, you know, he could have got that same result using like one gram. Like, you know, it's like 5,000 milligrams in like one ounce of weed. And it's like if people knew that, they might like approach it differently and just feel more comfortable making all these things. And so sure. that, that's really our goal. Mm -hmm. So uh, Arden's the company, but their product's Nova, right? Yeah. So the pro the product is Nova. It's also known as the Lift. Uh, we call it, a lot of people call it the Ardent too. So okay. Yeah. Is the I was just wondering because Nova does it come with like because I saw your video where you do make the oil and you put the yeah. container of oil with the bud inside the the machine. Yeah. Do you come with those kind of containers? Because you know people are questioning like, what do I put in there? I don't oh yeah, yeah. Know. So we I keep kicking this machine. Sorry. Oh, there you yeah. go. All right. Um, so, we can hear you fine. Um, yeah. So this is our silicone sleeve. So this is a little infusion sleeve that um right here that slides right into the machine. So after you decarb, and this is what you can use for the concentrates as well. So okay. you just stick it in here. And we developed this for the concentrates because what we found was people were putting it in there and they were using like a glass jar, or shot shot jar, shot glass, and it was just really sticky and hard to get off. So we made something that was food grade, you know, um uh, yeah. silicone that they can stick that in here or after you decarb your bud you can decarb it in here also and then just pour the oil in afterwards and then stick it put it through another cycle and okay. then we also created this cool little funnel here this little this is actually brand new this is like breaking we haven't shown this anywhere yet but it's our new little funnel and it's our first little it's our first uh branded like accessory but people were having a lot of time straining and so we have this and it slides right in here and then they pour it out and they can clean it and it just pops out it just like makes it really simple the whole idea do you have anything like, that helps with the appropriate dosing like do you have any of those things yet like measuring measurement cups or anything in your no in your we don't kit? have those but i know people are like really on the that dosing piece when somebody figures that out that's going to be like the key there are some things on the market now that kind of claim to do that but nothing's accurate you know what i mean that like for a patient patient but um we you know people can people can kind of figure out their dose based on the math you know what i mean and we have a dosing calculator coming out but you know, depending on where you're at, you can figure it's going to be somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. You know what I mean? That's usually on average, you know, um, it's, it's you know, people want to do more than guesstimate sometimes. Though, but too. Was it, for right. dosing, isn't also about flour amount they're using. So like, say, no. one gram and then the quality of the flour itself is going to be based on what, you know, uh, I got a high CBD one, you know, oh, shit, I'm not going to have a good time today, but my back's going to be great. I mean. You know, it comes down to the flower, no? Yeah, totally. And 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 like Tom was saying, when you it's a simple math equation when you're doing it and you know what percentage the flower is. So anybody who's buying it from a dispensary, it has it right on the back, what the percentage is, they can really, really hone in. Sometimes people are, if they're growing at home, they don't know what that percentage is. Um, if they just test one piece of the batch that they would know. And there are just some people that, you know, are still getting it on the, you know, from the weed man and they don't know like 
they just don't have a clue, you know? So yeah. we just guide, we have a dosing video where we guide them about how to do the calculation and then tell them that it probably falls somewhere between, you know, 10 and 20%, but that they can kind of test it out. And then once they know that they've locked in on that. So nice. I, I, so you're, um, you, you, you take med uh, marijuana for your, your medical purposes, but also I know part of your story is you have a, an encounter, encounter with the law. Like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, so I use cannabis for medical purposes, but like, let's be clear. Like I love cannabis. I use it for wellness purposes. I think that, you know, people um, should not be at all ashamed of their use of this for, you know, just to enhance their lives. Right. I'm somebody who, sister. yeah. I mean, I'm somebody who was, a teenage mom, I made it through college, graduated in time from an Ivy League school, went and, you know, started this, became a lawyer, had a whole career doing that, you know, and then developed a product, started a business, like, and cannabis has been just my, you know, close companion and friend and supporter through all of that. And so um, when I was a lawyer, I, but when I was a young lawyer, it was definitely something that I never hit it because honestly, when you are a, when you're an avid cannabis consumer, it's kind of hard to hide it, right? Um, but um, but it was very clear to me when I was a young lawyer that um, that I had to be careful about what was going on. And even though I work for a liberal law firm, I would hear them. There was I remember distinctly that a professor at like Harvard ended up getting busted because he was growing in his backyard. And when I came in, we all kind of like sat at this attorney's table together for lunch. I thought everybody was going to say like, oh, that was so crazy about the law. But people were like, oh, he was so reckless and everything. And I was like, oh, shit. I mean, if, if oh something God. happens with me and this, this is well, going to be Think about hard. it like 100 yeah. years. Well, like, wouldn't it have been 100 years ago now? No, it would have been more. 150 years ago when they were talking about like abolitionists or like, you know, the same type of thing. The people that are just coming from being inside, that's how the law is. Don't question yeah. it. I'm a lawyer to be safe. I'm a lawyer because I have an ego. I'm a lawyer because I, you know, I, I'm trying to suit those things and always have a good job and be like, no, no, I don't want to know anything about that because it's illegal. And I've sworn an oath to, you know, uphold the law. So they, they're kind of in this catch 22. And I would be in law school, you know, smoking illegal weed because it was all you get <laughs> your hands on. Uh, and it's, it, it's still the only type of weed in Wisconsin. They don't have any legal weed in Wisconsin. And so, um, you know, it just shocked me all the time because then I just, you know, time travel back in my mind and be like, really? So if you were a lawyer then and that was the law and you swore to upheld an oath, would you have been on that side? Is that what you're telling me? And they're like, no, well, weed is different. And I'm like, OK, <laughs> OK. But how? How is it different? I mean, right. why, why is it OK to put me in jail? Why, why is, is it OK, okay to put a person in jail? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's what I ended up asking one day. And I was very surprised that I was even, you know, put in that situation because by that time, so I was growing my own, you know, at some point I, it, I was very clear to me that like, I could not keep the deal, you know, relying on the street. Right. Because yeah. I was using it for medicine and, and I just love the plant so much. I had gone to Jamaica a couple of times, seen it grow. And I was like, Oh, that is like definitely for cool. me as far yeah. as like, wow. That, talk about a different like interaction and experience with the yeah. plant, you know? Um, so set up my little room in my house and, and started growing these plants. And I was driving uh, my son. I went um, and dropped him off um, to camp and I was driving on the way to, um, to the, um, to the train station in the morning. And I must've taken a right on red in Massachusetts. You can take a right on red, but unless there's a sign and apparently there was a sign, I didn't see it. And all of a sudden I see the blue lights behind me. I pull over. It's like middle of summer. I'm like in my, you know, blouse and skirt on the way to, to get, you know, to catch the train and the police officer comes over and he walks over and he saw like my bag open and, a and, you know, a little bit of um, like baggy or something he saw and oh. he immediately was like, get out of the car. And I was like, what do you, you know, I shouldn't have to get out of the car. He ordered me out of the car. So I got out um, and he starts searching the car and I'm like, you do not have permission to search the car. He said, I have, you know, you, you know, I have probable cause. Yeah. 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 A terrible yeah. I have, and, a criminal. You know, right? and basically, um, and so he goes and he searches the car and he goes into the back into like my, my larger bag and he finds this um, mason jar. And so this mason jar oh, is, yeah. And this may, and this is after decriminalization. Let's be clear. So this was in 2009, Mar Massachusetts decriminalized in 2008. So anything under an ounce, was a ticket, ticketable offense that you got a hundred dollar ticket. That's it. 
So knowing this and being a lawyer, do you think that I was riding around with more than an ounce? No. I, I, <laughs> no I've, already, I've already got my mason jar picked out for the first of the year. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Seven eighths of an ounce yeah. of marijuana in that. And I'm taking it out everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. That was my, you know, and, and so I knew what was in there and I knew that it was half an ounce max because it was just what I had on me, you know? Sure. And, and so um, as soon as he found that, he comes over turns me around, puts the handcuffs on, pushes me into the back of the police car. I'm like completely protesting at this time saying like, what's going on? I should be getting a ticket. This is not over an ounce. He puts me in the back of the police car. I, I watch as my car is getting impounded and I'm in the back of the police car with handcuffs oh. behind my back, crying at this point, thinking what the F yeah. is going on here? You know yeah. what I mean? So he's bringing me to the, the station and I'm like, uh, you know, freaking out at this point. Uh, he brings me to the station. This is the town I live in, right? This is my town. This is where I own a home. Oh. And and I practiced in Boston, but I obviously represented people like all, you know, around that area. So so they he goes and I, he pulls me into the back of the, like the holding area and on um, this like cement bench and starts booking, starts the booking process. And and I'm t the whole time I'm saying, this is not an ounce. You know, what's going on here? I'm crying. And I'm also, but I'm also like, thinking really hard now. And I'm like, yeah. uh, how do I get out of this? Right. How, how, do, how the hell do I get out of this and go home? And I asked him, where are you taking me? What's going on next? You know, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to book you and you're going to be arraigned at Stoughton district court. And that's when I was like really flipping out because I represented clients there. And I'm like, I'm literally about to get oh. paraded in the court that I represent clients but with my hands and the cost of, of, you know what I mean? Over yeah. there. So I think and think, and I'm just like thinking all my legal skills and I'm not a, I'm not a criminal attorney. Right. I'm like, um, I was a litigator. Um, so at that time I was like representing uh, companies like Sears and Pepsi and like lease disputes and, and, um, insurance. Oh, you were like, your honor, I'd like to make a contemporaneous motion to dismiss this prosecution. Yeah. Can I do that? <laughs> totally, I, I, I'm not thinking. sure how the criminal stuff works. You know? Yeah, I have no idea. I'm just like, um, yeah. yeah, can I look over your lease or, you know, and negotiate <laughs> something? Um, right. so, but I'm sitting there thinking like, this is really fucked up. Like they are really violating my civil rights. That's what yeah. I started to think. Like I'm here in handcuffs over something that's supposed to be like a, a civil violation. So this, and also this like woman, there's always these like these prohibition haters, man. They like, they are hardcore. So there's this lady in there with him and she's like with dispatch or something. And she's like, you know, whispering to him and talking. And I say, but hands behind my back, you know, you're violating my civil rights. You have no reason to have me here. You um, do not have any probable cause to have me here. And the woman says to him, not even dressing me, just says to him, no, that's not true. You had probable cause on the side of the road to think that that was over and out. And I was like, man, this lady really wants me to go to jail. For real. Like, you're saying, like why do you want me? Like, really? That is what you're kind of spending your time and energy and yeah. effort on? It's the money. Yeah. We went over this. Like, you know, who do we talk? Maggie, who were we talking to that was, ex oh, it was Jeff. Jeff Hall, the guy that he is a criminal lawyer and he practices. And so he's oh, talking yeah. about like how callers work and like how they'll get money from mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. arrest and prosecute. And then we had the uh, the Levy brothers on, yes, I'm sorry, last Sunday or last Wednesday, I think we had him on our show. And those were the guys that got popped for the 106 pounds in New York. And it's a very similar story where somebody, and this is, I mean, yours was in 2009, 10 years ago, jump, jump forward 10 years later, it's a legal transaction and they're still doing this to people. I mean, it was through FedEx. Yeah, I mean, yeah that was insane. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's like, what, what drives people? What, what hair up their ass is like, uh, you know, you're a criminal. You're a bad person for taking care of yourself. For feeling better yeah because yeah, like the wellness i take it as yeah. well for like when you explain to it like that i'm like yeah it really is the shit i can't believe it's underutilized and it's it's causing us harm as a society that we are underutilizing it and not only that you can feel abused and and just you know rolled by the whole system if you are trying to even do it legally like the the levy brothers were doing yeah. And, and think about how I thought I was protected at that point after decriminalization. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm just living my life and thinking that we fought for, you know, and that we got something here by this vote. And and then that was all taken away. But I said when she basically responded saying that, I was like, listen, you guys have that might have been true on the side of the road. I'll even give you that. But we are here at a police yeah. station right now. Like you have every, you have a scale. Yeah. Right. You go and go and weigh that. And it got like super quiet, like dead quiet. They both left. 20 minutes later, he comes back and says, um, okay, you can go. It was 14 grams. And I oh, was like, Jesus. Yeah, I know. It was a half ounce. Like you said it was a half ounce. You knew it was a half yeah, ounce. Yeah, I was right? like, you know? I, I told you. I said, and he was like, okay, you can go. He let me go. I No car, no nothing. I had to like 
go get a cab to my uh, my car. It was really traumatizing. But at that point, yeah. I was like, okay, yeah. I I need to make some moves here and try to. You well, know. you feel defenseless. I imagine it's it's uh, you yeah. you probably have some PTSD, sir. Right. Well, hopefully that was one of her qualifying conditions aside from all the other qualifying conditions. Yeah. But this also goes back to like, this is the supply limits or the possession limits uh, being abused in real time. And Illinois has got the one ounce possession limit. So is this exact thing going to be happening to other people in Illinois come January 1st, where they feel empowered, they feel like they're within their rights, but somebody sees it and they're like, there's no way that's a half ounce because they have no freaking clue what a half yeah. ounce looks like. And then yeah. they get arrested. Do they have possession limits in your guys' states? Yep, they definitely do. So under our um, under our uh, adult use, it's one ounce outside of uh, the home. But there's a gray area where up to two ounces, it's just a ticket. Mm -hmm. So if you have, you know what I mean? So you, it's publicized that it's one ounce and that's what people are going by. But, um, you know, there's still that wiggle room. And then we can have 10 ounces in the home. Um, but but only one can be out and free. The rest have to be under lock and key. So there's it's that rule. Too. For the but home there home. also are some funky things about um, like driving. When you're driving, it's supposed to be like in your trunk, locked away, or you can get a five hundred dollar fine. So you know, there's like you mentioned, always the ways to you know find and, and tax and get the money out yeah. there. But obviously, a lot better than where we were. And and that's like that's always my point as an activist is like. Decriminalization is good, but it's always only the first step to legalization because there are always going to be certain people that are targeted, that are there. Basically, I think of um, um, uh, decriminalization as a, as a, if the police want to give you the reason of that, they will, but it's not a legal protection for anybody. And that's why you have to have like, no, it's one ounce and it doesn't matter what's going on. You have that. And um, well, I, I still think that possession limits are just asking for continued interference agreed. by all enforcement because like I can go have all the vodka, all of the vodka that kills me, please. That is within my legal rights. You know? Yeah, and I and I agree a hundred percent. I guess um, I've started to be used to working what what we were, you know, at, at this yeah. point what we have. But I agree, like possession limits are ridiculous to just to begin with. And let's be real, like even make that cop even look worse. The one that gave you a hard time. So like he's cool with you being under an ounce, but if it was like an ounce and five grams, it'd be like, oh, you're still in trouble now. Like I just don't understand. I think yeah, I, I, it's, I agree. I agree. At that point, yeah. it's like okay, well, <laughs> still the same person I was before. You know, you arrested yeah. me, but and, it, and they just let you go. Like that was it. And a case after. So the. I mean, obviously no car and all that stuff. Did they release all your, your, your yeah, stuff? Yeah, so they there? were just like, no, you can go. So the car was at the impound. So I had to like take a cab, go down there, pay money and to get my car out. And of course they like jacked my car up on the way and like my bumper was off. Like it was like one of those days that just had. And it's so funny because at that point I just shoved that down into the back of my mind and I really didn't think about it for a long time. I was just like, oh my God, I almost, my whole like, life flashed before my eyes as far as like, you know, I have a young kid at the time. I, this is my whole career. This is everything that I work for to yeah. be a lawyer. And it just like, honestly, think about what it would have happened if I was a doctor or a teacher or anybody else that wasn't a lawyer trained to say you're violating my civil rights and you're right. probable cause, you know what There's I mean? Anybody like, that's got a job that has to take federal money too. So if you are a nurse, I mean, like uh, people in the healthcare profession, talk. people in the law enforcement profession, people in any profession where money's coming from uncle Sam, no. Yeah. And, and, th and then they, not only that, they, they would, you know, they would have had an arrest record. And thankfully, like, I don't have a Corey now because I would, you know, they didn't finish that booking process, but that was something that was um, very traumatic for me. And when I did have the opportunity to, um, to go and help write the law in Massachusetts for adult use and mm -hmm. actually come out, come up with my, you know, come out with my story, because by the time I was invited to help write by marijuana policy project, the um the question four for Massachusetts and I became a spokesperson for the campaign you know by that time um you know I, I really never had talked about it like honestly I never told anybody that that happened and I we were I was at these like town hall meetings you know talking about pro-legalization and they would have all these you know anti-prohibitionists and there was this one guy he was a senator um a Mass Massachusetts senator and he would sit and sit next to me and and he said one day i was talking about you know the disparity in the arrest statistic and he interrupts and says that's not true no one's getting arrested here in massachusetts oh and i was sitting there that day and i was so polite i didn't say anything back but it was shocking and i went to the campaign manager and i was like listen i need to come out and talk talk because if people you know what you know why they don't believe it because it's not happening in their neighborhood 
There you, know? you go. Yeah. And they're not seeing it happen. But guess what? It's happening. And so we were able to actually bring on like a judge that I had worked with before who had, you know, worked with kids who were getting overcharged. And, you know, they had this kid had four joints on him and was charged with possession with intent to distribute. Right. Yeah. So that's how they're getting around it. He yeah. had a total of two grams of weed, half a gram per joint intent to distribute. And that was and that was under decriminalization. So you see yeah. how they you know what I mean? They'll, they'll find any way to kind of. To, to make it still, you know, and that's because I mean, it has to be because they have a profit motive behind it. Oh, yeah, gotta I mean, be. it was one of those things where it's like, no, buddy, we're not supposed to be doing that no more. Uh, and they would knock it off. No, I mean, it, it, there has to be a motivation there somewhere. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. And what is that motivation? Well, I imagine the disparity, too, of like people who they're giving a hard time to a young kid that you brought in, probably, uh, 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 you know, people who are, are not from money. You know, I mean, that's going to be a thing. Not once you're in the system, you're just part of the freaking revolving door. Yeah, uh, and it, just, it just becomes a, a, a way like an MO, right? It just becomes yeah. a way that, you know, certain, um, you know, police departments begin to operate and that just becomes the culture, you know, and it's no secret that the war on drugs was started as a war on black people, brown people, Ooh. anybody who dissented against and the government, you know. And yeah. so, against <laughs> the government. Yeah. That's right. Yes. So, oh, you know, uh, if if you go back in history and you listen to the Nixon tapes regarding the, uh, the the Controlled Substances Act, which he spearheaded, of course, and then the way they got the Democrats to go along with it is they shoehorned uh, Part F to the Controlled Substances Act, which uh, impaneled the Schaefer Commission to do the studying to see where cannabis should actually be scheduled. And it said it shouldn't be scheduled at all. Nixon threw that in the trash. And then, you know, he's on tape asking, talking about the damn Jews. Yeah. Yeah. Like what is that? They are. And he wants a statement on marijuana that, what is it, like, hits him right in the puss. I mean, so, like, he was Donald Trump making. A yeah, statement. I was just going to say, yeah. sounds what? familiar. You yeah, know? I know, right? <laughs> Let me just let me know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, 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 Chanel, that, that's the one thing that Massachusetts, I think, did right as far as the, the cannabis board you're part of, because you have you, you have Shaleen. And so, yeah, so Shaleen's on the committee. There's two different things in Massachusetts. There's oh, the commission okay. and there's five members of the commission. And those folks are full time. They are, you know, um, they are leading the charge and writing the regs. Then there is the advisory board and there's 25 of us. Oh, and okay. so we advise the commission. We work with the community and just stakeholders generally to come up with recommendations. We put those forward to the commissioners and basically help them like iron out the details of these different pieces. Um, I think of us us as acting as a bridge between the all of the different you know um basically the public and yeah. what's happening um and and just providing a different voice and and um so my seat is actually for people uh, somebody who has the experience providing legal services to cannabis businesses and okay. there's different there's different expertise for each person on the advisory board neat um but yeah, well, in Massachusetts, we had um, a real focus on equity. And that started when Shalene and I were writing the law. And we actually, I pulled in Northeastern Law School and professors that I had there, because Northeastern is a, a social justice focused law school. Oh, okay. And so it's so funny when I look back on my life, you know, uh, even uh, the arrest, all of those things, they just like teed up in such a perfect way to like lead me to this point. You know, yeah. um, the same thing with Miggy and me. Cause like nine, 10 years ago when I wrote this law, I'm sorry, this, this book. And then like, I had to go to work for a bank law firm. And then in nine years, you'll explain to banks how to do it. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had some of those like yeah. weird full circle moments, you know, now and all this stuff. And, um, and so Shalina and I like got this. It, it's so funny when you think about it, it, we got this tiny little piece in the law that said that the industry had to, positively impact communities harmed by prohibition and then after that was passed you know the legislature tried to talk about like learning um learning about civ you know civics as you go right yeah. i was never really like into politics that much and i've been thrust into it and you learn all of these different you know pieces Ugh. but in massachusetts after we legalized um the the legislature who had never done anything right around cannabis had some time to basically change the entire ballot yeah. And when the house went and they went and they made their changes, they pulled out our one little equity thing. They pulled all the way out. But by that point, we had already started Still. our nonprofit. Still. Mm. What year was this? This was, yeah, this was back in 20. Um, this was back in 2014, 16, right after it passed. And so 16, the, the, the prejudice is real. 
Yeah. And oh, it was yeah. just like, but at that point though, you know, I'll tell you, we had some amazing advisors and there were, um, this one guy in particular, Patrick, he had worked on campaign reform in Massachusetts. And I didn't even know this, right? Because there had been like major sweeping campaign reform when it came to Massachusetts elections. It was made by ballot initiative. And what do you think the legislature did with that when it got their opportunity? They completely eviscerated and it like never came to- It did an Arizona on its ass. Yeah. And so, and they were like, and so Patrick was like, listen guys, I think you, you know, this was great, but you need to mobilize right now because they're gonna try to take this away from you. So we did, and we started meeting with like all elected officials and we made a nonprofit and we did all of these mm. different things. And um, so by the time that the house pulled it away, we just pressed that button of everybody mo like come out. And not only did we get our original equity provisions um, sustained, we also um, got all of those other equity provisions because other groups got together and they made co-op, um, you oh. know, uh, provisions. And then um, we were working with um, Sonia Chang Diaz put together the, you know, um, a proposal for the equity uh, priority, which became very important. And we supported that. And so it was very interesting. Like, it was amazing seeing how all that works. Like, you have a nonprofit yeah. and you use that and you use people and their voices. And then you, oh. but then you work with people inside the legislature and you know, it's, it's funny. Everybody has their own little part, but I am like really, I mean, so proud to say at least on paper, right. That paper yeah. is different than implementation, well, but let's talk what, about how is the implementation going? Yeah. So on paper, it's awesome on implementation. It sucks. Let's be honest. Like we have one legislative, you know, maybe we do this with the amendment next time, but the, I'll, I'll visit with that in a bit. I want you to explain how it's going. So it's going, the, the conversation is on equity, which is important, right? Yeah. But the problem with Massachusetts, and I see this problem in Illinois as well, is that this you you're already starting from behind the the start when you, you you already are are way behind when you have a medical program that didn't prioritize equity right oh, yeah. so in massachusetts what we had is a, a program that allowed a lot of it hey remember that one boston dispensary that i mentioned that was oh. open guess what that was a medical dispensary so hmm. you have these deep deep seated preferences within the marketplace for these players that already came that had no equity involved because in Massachusetts they're zero none of the players were involved were um uh, you know qualified in that yeah. way and yep. so now you have a preference for the equity applicants which seems good on paper but it's pales in comparison to the preference that the medical have under the new law as well and so i think it's really important um Sometimes it's hard to see how these different pieces will play into each other, but that really is where the devil is in the details because it doesn't matter what it says on paper, how it plays out in real life is, you know, what matters. Yeah. And we're going to see that, but, but the thing is like, and then look, because uh, yeah, I have to read all these things and I'm trying to understand and advise my clients on how to navigate them. And so what I noticed was in Illinois and in Maryland, they took the social equity and they put it into and they injected it into the licensing process itself. But then in Massachusetts, those social equity programs were there after you got the license. So it wasn't literally injected into the application process itself. It would come after the license was hit. And so nobody got it. Right. So in Massachusetts, there's two different things. Number one, there's like a social equity program that people are allowed to get training and other things like that. We had a big stall out in that that they that that program did not start before it was time to get certified as somebody who get, get priority as a license you're right and so um and generally it didn't start for quite a long time which you know honestly it should have been started years ago and so mm -hmm. it just leads to um and, and the program has started now which is great right and these things take time the, and, and that's not a fault of the commission but what it it leads me to know and understand is that you cannot, you really have to be super aggressive with any equity provisions, especially when you already have a, a playing field, because let's not pretend that the medical market is not the same as the adult use market, especially yeah. if you're letting medical players come into that marketplace. And so I think that's a challenge there. And then the biggest challenge, like you guys were talking about before I came on, is just this not in my backyard. It doesn't yeah. matter where you are in Massachusetts, aside from a couple of the... Um, 
the um, cities and towns out west that are just like, you know, really desperate for revenue and businesses and understand the economic boom that could come from cannabis coming there and being there over near New York and the Berkshires and everything. It just like makes a lot of sense to have, Mm. um, you know, to welcome that. Um, You just you see these um, in Massachusetts. In order to get a license from the commission at the state level, first, you have to get what's called a host community agreement. So you have to get the town to agree that you can come there and and that and that town can can basically I won't say extort, but it's extort. Yes, Uh, that's why we don't like local municipalities having more. You know. So they so they they can extort up to three percent legally up to three wow. percent of, of you in addition to the state tax. The problem was wait so they can that, have ownership of three percent. No, it's three percent of revenue. Okay, so it's three oh, percent of revenue paid directly. Well. Yeah. Yep, paid directly every year. Fuck. The problem the problem was is that these big medical marijuana companies were coming in and they're saying. Sure, we'll give you the three percent, and we'll build a new this, and we'll do that, and 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 all the towns were taking them, and the the cannabis control commission, because of the way that the law was written, didn't really feel that they had the authority to come in and stop that, right? And so they didn't, which led to widespread corruption. By you can imagine, and now the federal government has stepped in, which with our U.S. attorney Andrew Lelling has now already arrested one mayor in uh, Fall River for wow. taking $600,000 worth of bribes mm. uh, and now has subpoenaed and there's a grand jury investigation going on and Boston has re- just recently been subpoenaed and that's why you now will see oh. all of a sudden the mayor of Boston is more willing to have the discussion about making an independent board because you know even regardless of people doing things wrong or not the implication is there and it, and honestly the the system was set up to uh, encourage that almost when you have just a few local officials making those decisions you guys know it's like it's just rife for you know you're taking the most aggressively narcissistic people in this in the town (laughs) and giving them power over millions of dollars yeah and and well the accountability too is what you guys are fighting for uh i know at least Janine, i've seen her twitter posts and some issues going on last month with uh the accountability as far as the requirements for and some people fighting her on that Oh yeah, and so so that that I think is a huge problem for people because you can especially for equity, right? So you can imagine, think about a small equity player who's coming in trying to maybe even work with the town to do something where because it doesn't have to be three percent. Let's be clear, like it's up to three percent, and it's supposed to be related to the harm or or services that the cannabis company is going to need from the town, right? So like I've never seen an accounting like that for the money that's coming in, you know, and yeah. and and I think that um, how can a small player compete? with somebody that's going and doing all of these different things. So um, I do applaud places like Cambridge and even Mass- and even Boston who's trying to work through and get an equity ordinance, even though neither of them is perfect. Um, Cambridge was amazing though, because what they did at the local level, um, because again, remember that at the local level, you gotta get the approval first. At the local level, they said that for the first two years that they were only going to allow equity applicants to get wow. licenses. Amazing, awesome. right? Yeah. What do you think happened the next day? The big medical dispensary sued oh and said this is illegal, whatever. So now there's a lawsuit going on, and we have to, ju- you know, figure out how we're going to be supporting that. Um, because, uh, yeah. So it's really tough. It's just, and, and that's the part that does get frustrating. You know, you feel like, I think that's just any social justice work that you know you're putting like a jo- a drop in a very big bucket, but then yeah. you also, you know, in mass, you also then see like, oh, the first equity applicant getting licensed, you know, and you start to see, you know, folks, and we're having job fairs and these other things, and and, and in Massachusetts, that first little piece of language that we got in there that the, the has been read by the commission and the regulation is that everybody, even if you're not an economic empowerment applicant, everybody has to have a plan about how they are going to improve communities disproportionately impacted by, um, by cannabis prohibition. And so now every single, you know, all these big companies have to do things, have to do something. And it feels good to be, you know, know that I was a part of that. Heck yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Awesome. Awesome. Man, this hour went by fast, dude. It sure did. Are we hey, already, you know are what? We already we, done? What, we're, one we're last one I, to, I have to say is home grow, protecting home grow. That's just so oh. important for people. And yeah. I think yes. I get asked about that a lot. And I feel like, honestly, like a legalization scheme is not complete without people's ability to grow at home because you are just criminalizing that, you know, person. And, and after I was arrested that time, I was growing at home. And you know what started happening? The police started showing up after Uh-oh. I got arrested. They started just kind of like randomly showing up at my door. They came by one day just to 
to tell me that they saw that I was at my mother's house and that my oh. sticker was expired. I was like, oh what? God. And I knew I wasn't an idiot. I That night I went and I cut down all my plans and I oh. cried while I was doing it, you know? And I was a patient at that point. And think about all that money that I had. I had to go back to, to buying it from other sources. And so I think that that's something we really need to protect people's ability to have. You know, there shouldn't be limits on possession and that people should yeah. not be, you know, stop people from growing. And that's how people learn about the science of cannabis. And that's how they learn to love it as well. That's real legalization, right? Yeah. Well, I'm glad that they do have home grow in Illinois and also in Washington State and then also in um now they only have it in Illinois and Washington State for medical. Do you have a uh, full adult use home? Yes, we have full adult use. And I always nice. think that that's something that can come even if you don't have it now. In Massachusetts, we can grow up to six plants each, up to twelve plants in a household, and we can gift up to one ounce. As long as you don't get paid for it, you can gift up to one ounce to per you know, to anybody. And that, well, that we're really gonna empowers that language people. so that I can start lobbying uh, for yeah, uh, yeah, that's that yeah. the beautiful <laughs> thing about being a cannabis lawyer is these laws are brand new. They are not settled and they are changing on a daily basis. A hundred percent. And that's one thing that I, that I am most you know happy about is when I was a younger lawyer and I was getting arrested there, I didn't realize how much power individual people have, especially lawyers to go and say like, no, this, law needs to be changed and we can get support and we can do it. That's right. Hey, before we wrap up though, I wanted to give a shout out to NetArt GFX. This is our thumbnail guy. He, he, he dropped hey. us a comment. Yeah, he's great. I uh, really <laughs> great. love working with him. Awesome. Well, Chanel, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, where can we find and follow Ardent? Oh yeah. So look us up. Um, it's Ardent, A-R-D-E-N-T, cannabis.com. And this was so, so, so fun. Thank you guys. I'd love to um, keep in touch and be back one day. hundred okay. percent. Oh yeah. Yeah. We can't wait to have you back. We'll talk more about the updates because it sounds like the Eastern seaboard is going to have a very busy 2020 at a legislative scale. A hundred percent. I'm actually going down um, on December 7th and talking at the minority kids uh, the Minority Cannabis Business Association is having a summit about the tri-state area and the policy there. And I'll be talking about what we've done in Massachusetts and what could be done better. Um, yeah, I'm so excited about what's happening, you know, all up and down the East Coast. And and what's the strategy, you know, around um, the South, right? Um, think about equity and the implications there. Oh and um, I what think we're the really Act, behind the ball. Illinois bill, Maryland, where you inject the social equity into the corporate formation structure for the application points. Otherwise, they aren't going to work together. And not only that, I've seen options and corporate formations put together where the social equity person's actually sold his stake before he's even got it. Mm. And I'm mm. like, yeah, oh, oh yeah, totally. Yeah. So many different kinks to work out. But Lisa, uh, at least we have the option and at least we're moving forward. You know, that um, that that's the great thing. A lot better than we were. For sure. And then, Tom, who do we have coming on this Sunday? Oh, this Sunday, we Ooh. finally have Tuna coming on. And that is Robert Platshorn, one of the longest serving uh, cannabis POWs. And he is on a new Silver Tuna tour in Florida. And we'll have uh, a, a wonderful hour uh, at the Cannabis Congregation on Sunday. Uh, he's he's really cool. I Meggie and I have known of him for, well, heck, I've known him for like 10 years. So I, I even high bought time. him uh, Irv Rosenfeld's tins of joints from him for $420 oh, when he was raising some money. That's right. Sweet. Well, guys, thanks for tuning in. As always, like and subscribe to keep up with all cannabis legalization news. We'll see you later. Cha-ching.